Welcome to the Soar Above Success Podcast, where you'll learn how to soar above your competition. And now, your host, Yuri Vilk. Hey everybody, my name is Yuri and welcome to the Soar Above Success Podcast. I'm here with Frank D. Dominicus and he's a human resources business trainer with over four decades of experience. Uh, his specialty is developing human potential for harmony and productivity. Frank, welcome to the show. I'm so happy for you to be here. Well, it's my honor and uh, to be here. I'm, I'm pleased and, uh, and humbled to be in the audience of your other uh, participants in your show as well. Thank you very much. Great. So I know you've been doing a lot of work in personal leadership. And Frank, I just want to know, what's your take on it? What's your definition of personal leadership? My personal definition has become refined actually recently having done an informal survey I've done a lot of speaking and workshops on leadership in the past year in particular and I find that the hoi polloi has a certain connotation around generalized words like truth or power relationship leadership and oftentimes these urbane definitions are quite removed far removed and very anomalized intellectualized versus my de- personal definition of personal leadership. When I find someone I really feel enthused about following, follow me, right? The great mandate, follow me. Paul even wrote a song about that, follow me. But at any rate, when I feel like, wow, I want to follow his role model, there's so-and-so, there's, boy, that's a visceral feeling, and it's based on my reaction to who they are. It's not something they're doing to me. I even feel affected this way by biographies of famous people that I read. Wow, I wish I could sit across the table with them for an hour. I wish I could be like them. It's it's my reaction to the positive values and attitudes I see exemplified in what I call their charisma factor. We all have attraction and we all have push with people based on our limits and styles. However, in terms of leadership, that charisma factor is not a show business brand and polishing such as taking Norma Jean and making her Marilyn Monroe. No, the visceral reaction I have is is what counts. So I think people need to develop, uh, I don't mean to shit on people, but in terms of developing leadership, I think to develop that, one needs to have the, uh, the appropriate values and attitudes for the culture in which they work and live and move. And I also define personal leadership not just in the traditional corporate sense, but in terms of community organizations, we all move within different circles of circles that are continuously like ripples intersecting with each other now that we all live in the cloud. Mm. And and also leadership within the family. I'm very much committed to the threat of society, which is families integrating in communities. I, I'm very much given to the strength of the social fabric of humanity, not just on a national level. Sure. Although I do what work I can do in that area in my own backyard. So that's kind of a long-winded answer, but that's my answer to what makes for personal leadership, how I define personal Excellent. Well, and now, Frank, I know you mentioned earlier that there was three things that define a leader. Uh, What are those three things that define a leader? And how? uh, we'll we'll get to the second part of the question later, but for now, let's, let's just... What are those three facets, either in a corporate setting or in a business setting? How can one actually be a personal leader? What are those three things? The three things are these. Number one, likability. And to be likable, one must have a sincere interest in the depth of the other person, not a passing exchange of words in a dialogue, such as we see in customer service often when workers inquire about how we're doing today yet are looking the other way or engaging in a conversation with a peer instead of waiting for the answer so likability means generally having a positive life philosophy uh, i think this is my bias of thinking that people are basically good at least uh, willing to be interested in the uniqueness of another person this is what makes us likable good listeners are sometimes thought to have the best personalities uh, so really listening and listening in depth for who a person is, I think, is number one. Number two is humility. And by humility, I don't mean a diminishing of oneself or, or one's uh, positive uh, aspects of one's ego or, or, or diminishing one's stre- strengths, hiding one's light under the bushel, as it were. 
But I think true humility is recognizing the importance of other people. And for me, I get to have a very holistic attitude about life to begin with. I am grateful for everyone, especially those who would probably not want to spend time with me or, or who have deemed themselves my critics or enemies or, or challenge my point of view. My friends help me to grow through their love and nurturing, but it's my critics and, and harshest evaluation that's helped me reflect on on myself and the source of that feedback too. So I'm grateful for all feedbacks. And thirdly, uh, the last quality is having an attitude of a servant. Once we recognize the importance of others and their self-esteem, recognizing their personal limitations, and thankfully to some good assessment tools out there, recognizing the power motives and needs of others, being able to truly service other people to and to have a joy in service. I find many peers in the business world, in my niche in particular, that are eager to develop wealth. I don't put that down. I seek wealth as well. However, I find that wealth comes to me as an expression of gratitude for work I've already done. So my work is I don't chase money. I work to be as competitive as I can with myself to produce the next best quality service or product that when I get up to speak, I want people to say, if I should die tomorrow, I want them to say, doggone it, you should have seen his last show. Boy, it was the best, it's his last one. So I do have that kind of uh, dark humor motivator to keep me going, thinking, what if this is my last day? I certainly want to make this the I love you moment or I can help you moment or I'm willing to be supportable, I am open, give me feedback, I won't cry, I won't bleed. Mm -hmm. But these are traits that uh, I've also, and this is number four I'll add on, these are traits that were, I was not born with or had in my youth, but were attitudes that I caught from positive mentors. Mm -hmm. or fortunately, all through my career, I have had a big brother, a big sister in my industry that would protect me from my own ignorance, mm -hmm. things I did not even know to ask about. And I always feel like a boy in that respect. My mentors now are 20, 25 years older than me, and I'm constantly amazed that they're feeding me knowledge that I would not have even um, known to ask about. So I just want to review them. You had, you mentioned likability, humility, and act, having a servant attitude. So, and that doesn't mean being a serf or a slave, but that means more so serving your, serving whoever it is that you, it is your market and making sure you're doing a damn good job at it. Define servitude for us. Servitude. Ser servitude I define as submission, a word that was used in the work of behavioral psychologist William Moulton Marston. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm going to reflect a little bit on my academic background and a little bit of what I do in uh, corporate team building. Mm -hmm. William Moulton Marston was a very complex uh, person, but very much rooted in the origins of real scientific measurement, merging physiology with psychology. The father of psychology, Wundt, in Lipsburg, Germany, uh, in 1800, late 1800s, had influenced a gentleman by the name of Munsterberg, who's recognized as the father of industrial psychology. Mm -hmm. he, he was appointed by William James, the father of American psychology, to Harvard. Munsterberg influenced William Moulton Marston. Marston was not as self-promotional as Jung and Freud was, although he was a contemporary. And while Jung and Freud were creating presuppositions based on their observations of clients about um, how the mind works, essentially. That was Freud's main claim to fame. Uh, William Moulton Marston did not get as much media coverage because he was looking at, quote-unquote, normal behavior. Mm -hmm. In fact, his groundbreak book is called Emotions of Normal People. So yep. that did not get a lot of attention, and it's a very dense book as well, merging uh, physiology and, and the early brain research and the neurons. Marston was eventually discredited from academia, not because of his knowledge, he was quite prolific in that regard, but because of a very interesting um, polyamorous lifestyle, which we'll save for another more colorful talk. At which time he helped early Hollywood learn about marketing, generating strong feelings of horror in horror movies, but not so horrible that people uh, vomit or run out of the theaters, as I did when I first saw The Blob at seven years of age. Etc. 
Mersten was invited by Detective Comics, the comic industry. Comics used to be comic strips, mainly of soldiers during the war, the great World War II. As the war waned and, and we got the upper hand and the war was ending, Detective Comics invented a very superhero called Superman, Cal L, for those of us who know him by his birth name. And the following year, in 1939, a darker fellow by the name of Batman, who had a lot of cool gadgets, was another uh, another writer on the emerging comic book industry. Well, the following year, uh, Mr. Gaines, the publisher of Detective Comics, asked marketers, and particularly those marketers who employed psychologists, behavioral psychologists like William Moulton Marston, talk about persuasion and influence in the public. And Marston leaned on his wife, Margaret Holloway, who was of equal standing in stature in terms of education, publishing, research. She worked for and with Marston. She had quite a dramatic influence on William Moulton Marston. She was indirectly tied to Margaret Sanger, the original founder of the birth control movement and feminist movement, uh, the founder of what's now called Planned Parenthood. She gave Marston the idea to give to Detective Comics, said, well, instead of Superman and Batman, who win by domination, create a woman, hence Wonder Woman. Mm -hmm. And Wonder Woman would not win by domination, but by love and submission. This was a reference to Marston's, what he called, comic propaganda. He was very much a feminist who believed that submission, to, love and submission to another is the way to world peace and to have genuinely love in society and love in individuals. He was quite in love with love and felt that was the ultimate expression of mental health. Sure. And, and well-being, an easy universal truth to align with that goes back to 2,400 years ago when pre-religion, uh, Paleolithic man, uh, it's said uh, or, or it's extrapolated from archaeological findings, worshipped the early gods, probably didn't even use the word gods in whatever language they had, but were amazed at earth, wind, fire, and water. The Greeks later each individually defined us as being made up of these fluids. Hippocrates, and before 100 years, in 400 BC, and Pedocles, a doctor, Italian doctor, uh, used this model as well. Hippocrates would say if someone had a hot temper, they were too fiery. If they were too much uh, wishy-washy, they were had too much water. Medicine was even based on this, which is why a lot of people died. If you had a fever, oh, you had too much fire fluids, you would be cut and bled. Uh, very interesting. How does this relate to personality, leadership? Well, to go back to Marston, Marston actually built on this concept and realized these temperaments were actually built on an XY axis. Two questions, two powerful existential questions one would ask themselves in, on self-reflection, which man seems to have been doing for at least 2,400 years and beyond. Mm -hmm. And the first question is, on, on the x-axis, is the world a friendly environment or adversarial, or does it fluctuate? And there's no right or wrong answer. This is just another filter. Just like Myers-Briggs asked some questions about how we look through our filter. Sure. Uh, although that's a popular instrument by history, and there is argument pro and con on the scientific testing of it, it still gives people a dialogue. I don't degrade Myers-Briggs. Uh, to, but to go back to to the DISC model based in ancient Greek philosophy and Marston giving it a language. The question is, if the world is favorable to you, your motivators are probably affection and warmth and you're a very touchable, huggable person mm -hmm. versus someone who's the opposite, who has limits on being touched or personal space and is low verbal and probably feels like the environment is more adversarial and you have to carefully navigate as you make your little decisions mm -hmm. in life. The y-axis, the vertical axis, at the top of it we might say is dominance. Do you feel like the environment, do you have power over the environment? This is how we perceive our power levels. Or are we at the bottom, are we totally submissive, are we powerless in effect, do we give up our power to another? So this is how Marston envisioned the personality. How does this relate to leadership? Go back to Wonder Woman and and serving others, and servitude, and it's kind of keys off the very feminist attitude of share power versus dominance. And this is also echoed in the, the research of Eric Erickson, the levels of moral development, that we learn as children to be dependent, and then in 
adolescence, we rebel, right? We define our ego, our independent self. We start seeing the world not as the child of our parents, but as an individual ready for their own lifestyle checkbook and, and other decisions. So then we're not really totally dependent, but we're weaning from, in our teens and 20s, weaning from dependency to independence. Okay. Then we grow to uh, a, a third level of power. We, we learn to manipulate our environment. We learn our charm factor. We learn how to make people like us, or at least be more hopeful of that. We learn to navigate through life. And then the fourth level of power would be the intergenerative generative level, which is, I guess the metaphor would be the kindly grandfather, grandparent, who has a lot of power or social power, but instead they use affection and warmth and share in power. So this concept of share power, tied back to Wonder Woman, uh, to Marston's early roots, to, to your direct question about servitude, and modeled by Wonder Woman. When I give my service to someone, uh, when I give of myself 100%, it's because I truly feel connected to the person, uh, ideally in a loving relationship, but not necessarily. Maybe it's a, it's a, it's a relationship of deep collaborative respect, as mm -hmm. I have with my workmates. I don't necessarily love them per se, but I like and respect them and, and respect the fact that we're not friends first, that we're working on business. So that same attitude of submission is there. And my best work in relationships, to go back to leadership, uh, the highest form of leadership, is shared power is when I have a collaborative relationship, we're beyond selling each other, it's now a mutual collaboration, we're on third base making a, uh, defining our product or service, defining our next step in productivity. Uh, at, at that level, we both give and take in terms of sharing power. Uh, fortunately, in the work that I do, I do have some excellent educational courses and resources that help people develop a dialogue uh, such as a couple that may have major differential and power levels or, or in what we call the influence factor, the emotionality levels. Great. Thank you so much for that, Frank. How can we relate personal leadership to, uh, let's say, somebody who owns a business and they have, they're have they dealing with a lot of different conflicts with employees or perhaps they don't even have employees. They're dealing with conflicts with their clients. In, in terms of how can we apply leadership to uh, small to medium businesses? Uh, I want to cite my source. My major source is Dr. David McClellan sure. of McGurr Institute in Boston. He's famous for having done the life extension studies that went on for over 25 years. That we, the insurance industry uses a lot of these numbers to say that as after 25 years, so many are wealthy, so many are poor, and it's a pretty steep pyramid uh, of numbers. Uh, McClellan did a lot of observations, and he found that everyone has a different leadership style. So even for the baker, the way they command their their employees, control and positive control is is important in business. Uh, the way they relate uh, has to do with the level of harmony uh, and how others perceive them. I would not say if they have problems. If you have wherever you have people, you have conflict. Mm -hmm. Even in friendships, you have disagreements and different points of opinion, different philosophical points, uh, disagreements on religion, etc. So my attitude is expect differences, but expect to find a way to dialogue on them. And to tie that in with the reference to Dr. David McClellan, for anyone, there are three styles of power. You might reflect on this as you look at your own sense, your inner sense of power. And one is what McClellan refers to as the dominant form. And what he means is the majority of decisions are controlled by one person unilateral decision making. Someone has to be the boss. If the house is burning down, you must use dominance to get people out of the burning building and not worry about being polite. So that's the attitude behind the dominant profile. It's my company, it's my business, I'm driving everything, I'm telling you what to do. If you don't like it, you can leave, find a better job. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the dominant attitude. In, in, in kind of a bit of a biased expression, it's not necessarily a negative form, but it is a form. You certainly want to dominate form of management with an army, with your fire department, with mm -hmm. your police department. Uh, but other cultures, uh, we'll make comment on that later. The second one, the second power style is associative or a democratic form of relationship. Friendly but not friends. Respecting differences, respecting limitations. So that baker, that local merchant may motivate his people simply by having good horizontal respectful communication, period. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, very simple. Majority of leadership patterns fall into this role. Mine certainly is. I happen to have a lot of good fortune, not because I push market anything, but I am sincerely interested in a real connection with people. So people who really know me and really know what I do from experience or observation or testimonials provide the best referrals. So consequently, I, I minimize uh, advertising costs. And in, in part because I take on larger sensitive projects as well. The third power style is called inhibiting. This might go back to the generative level of power I referenced earlier about um, Eric Erickson's levels of moral development. And the generative one might be the senior executive who owns a, I'm thinking uh, to stereotype, a small manufacturing facility in the sure. Midwest. Everyone loves him or her when they come into the office. Everyone says, hi, Mary, hi, Bob. Uh, if someone gets a flat tire, it's the boss that goes out that helps them uh, fix the flat. Uh, they, the general sense about them is uh, their affirmation of power would be, I have power, but I refuse to use it. So they tend to be more forgiven of mistakes. They tend to be very gentle with their people. So because they don't use power, they inhibit their power motive, actually. Mm -hmm. They actually generate more charisma or attraction factor. A majority of leaders in politics... And, and very, very powerful positions who can very much influence and sometimes affect lives not necessarily for the good, win respect of others by not using their power. So to summarize, the three power styles for the local merchant, for anyone, in relation to their suppliers, employees, etc., agents, would be the dominant form, the associative or democratic style of power, and lastly, the inhibited power motive style. Yeah. So I, I can imagine, you know, when you're working in an environment like that with multiple types of people and different types of personality, um, there could be some clashes. And, you know, there, there's going to be mistakes that you're going to make, especially if you're in a, in a position of leadership or in a position of power or control. And so my question for you, Frank, is what are the common leadership mistakes? What are some things that people do that you've, that you've observed, uh, maybe CEOs or company owners? What do they do uh, as far as leadership mistakes and how can they correct them? I think one of the greatest failings of leadership, and I must confess to my own painful learning in developing my own leadership, is the, is the tendency to work in isolation, to feel you're at the top of the uh, ivory tower, you're in your office and you have no real sounding board. So making major policy decisions, particularly those that influence workers, uh, making those decisions in isolation is a major failing. What can be done? What can be done is a communication, a double communication loop that was actually suggested by Dr. Tom Gordon mm -hmm. of Leadership Effectiveness Training way back in, in the early days of personal development. This company was one of the top five training companies in America at the time, a Leadership Effectiveness Training, which fortunately I was able to experience. And his concept was if you're making a really, really big decision and you think you need some feedback, give it to the next line, the next level of people, your supervisory management directors or direct employees, staff employees, whatever is appropriate, and ask for feedback. When you get the feedback, make adjustments, suspend your own bias, make adjustments, send that concept back down for review and comment and have it come back to you for final execution. This is called the down up, down up. And it's a very powerful way to work. The problem is some leadership styles, some negative leadership styles, have a tendency towards delegation but take back. The, the store chain, Kroger, has a great leadership program that trains their management. Uh, their managers work at King Supers and other major stores, Kroger stores. And their leadership program talks about this style about the tendency to give a task but want to take it back. Sure. Even if you don't take it back, which can dramatically impact on, on the morale of not just the individual but their peers, but the tendency to take it back and not suspend that bias, to be angry in your mind that, oh my God, I wish I hadn't give it, given Yuri that try. I should have done it myself. Oh heck, look what he's doing. Those, that type of self-talk exhibits itself non-verbally. It said there's no secret thoughts. 93% of the effect of all communications is nonverbal. I don't need to ask you what you think of me in terms of your level of respect for me. I feel that. Mm -hmm. I, I'm clear. I'm transparent. I, I think 
you feel you can assess the same level of respect I might have for you. Uh, sometimes we discount the sixth sense, although that's a, a very important part of leadership too. Some of the greatest leaders move on hunches. Uh, this confuses their subordinates and the general public sometimes. The uh, DISC model of leadership was used uh, to survey a number of executives of corporations in Hawaii, and it was found that the majority of them had that type of uh, high empathy, high drive type of profile, yep. a, a, a bias towards that. Not to say there aren't good, high critical type of leadership models, but the majority of them do tend to be people-oriented and tend to drive through obstacles to get past uh, their own belief systems. There, there, there are people who can confront their own limiting self-concept beliefs, uh, what they believe about themselves. They mm -hmm. could, they can enlarge the picture of who they are tomorrow or next year and actually grow into that to the point where they're unrecognizable to who they were three years ago. Yeah. This, is a, this is a trait of truly successful people, those who can change themselves. Uh, I know this is a bit of a drift from the, the submission and power uh, question put on earlier, but I, I think it all ties in well. Yeah, I completely agree with you. The top the top down approach, uh, kind of getting getting feedback from other people, is very important in order to develop your own personal leadership style, and also also to understand how are other people viewing you. How how is it that you know my whatever it is that I said to somebody or that I did, how does that impact them, and how does that ultimately impact the business, and how does that impact the work that they produce? And I think that's very important, a very key point that many of us sort of neglect or overlook is that we, we don't actually take the time to get feedback from other people. And that's ultimately the most the, the most important part of being a leader, of being a business owner, is to get feedback from people that you work with. Because ultimately that's the only way you're going to improve your business. I mean, look at, I like to take this example because the internet has provided us a transparent way of providing feedback, and that is Amazon. Look at all the feedback you get on Amazon's products, and most of the time they'll start they'll start actually messaging or removing products that have very low feedback scores because they're not going to be effective for their marketing campaigns, and frankly, they're not going to be effective for their bottom line. Uh, so by getting that feedback instantaneously from the web or from other sources, it allows companies to pivot and move on a dime and very, very quickly and very effectively and efficiently. So Frank, thank you so much for that information. That's very important. And I know you've, you've been working with teams a lot. And how can a leader prepare for team success? Or And what is team leadership in general? Uh, the first half of it, preparation, and the second half, team leadership, I'll address. Preparation, that's an astute question. Oftentimes, individuals, even trained, professionally developed individuals, do not prepare for success. They set a goal, they get excited, they drool over their lust for gold or the trophy, the award, the win, but they don't prepare their pre-approach, as I say, their own attitude, their own timeline for research and, and study uh, for creating a real plan. And in my belief, I'm an old systems guy, if it's not a written plan, it's not a plan. So, so that's the first half of, uh, of your answer. What is team leadership? Team leadership is the temporary suspension of power levels within a room, independent of title. So if I'm sitting in the conference room with everyone from the CEO to the janitor, we all drop our titles. We no longer have power, but our goal individually is to each be a, like a mastermind group, each mm -hmm. to be supportive of the other's individual team strengths to help identify those strengths in evaluation, to give feedback on what those strengths are, and to build on those individual strengths versus the normal, I shouldn't say normal, but usual tendency to pick on individuals. I mm -hmm. had a certain team that was full of driver, influencer types, and had one fault finder. And I had to protect the fault finder, I felt, because the fault finder wasn't negative per se, but relative to the enthusiasm of the other style, they certainly seemed that way when in fact every organization needs a devil's advocate every that's the second or third thing you do in business planning is develop a liability mindedness mm -hmm. and poke holes in your plan and look for all the ways you can fail get sued uh, mess up etc so so we certainly need that type of critic uh, we certainly need that type of balance in our own work patterns and with our teams team leadership 
To really develop team leadership, one needs a team leadership plan. As with any professional development process, first of all, the group willing to develop team leadership needs to be in agreement. In the work that I do, I ask the individuals who take some very, very sensitive uh, personal profile and assessments to be willing to share in their profiles sure. that reveal some pretty sensitive material about their motivations, fears, inhibitions, but to do that in an in a educational environment of safety and mutual confidentiality with the higher level management tools I use, management, sales, customer service, etc. Uh, these tools can actually be used online to digitally compare compatibility and look for resistance, interpersonal resistance factors that can be discussed and mitigated in advance uh, in a work setting in terms of team leadership. Uh, this helps the individuals to recognize and adapt to each other's strengths to make compromises on style, not necessarily content, mm -hmm. just in terms of style. And uh, in a work setting, if a team could, in the particular application I use online, up to nine people could look at every relationship, all the errors crisscrossing in the system dynamics, and actually get a team culture report so everyone can navigate the whole ship together, the entire climate. Uh, that, once again, that's an extended answer to your question. Sure. That's the most thorough way I can answer your question. No, I definitely appreciate that. Uh, very good information there, Frank. Um, now, I, I know you mentioned earlier there's managers, right, and there's also leaders. I understand from your point of view that these are two very different concepts and they're two very, very different styles of working with people. In, in your opinion, what's the difference between managing and leading and how can we become more, more successful managers and better leaders? The, the manager says do it, the leader says let's do it. Sure. That's the answer to the first part of your question. How do we become better managers and leaders? First of all, we become aware of our own style through the previous steps I outlined in our previous conversation. Mm -hmm. And then, in terms of uh, leadership, uh, particularly in terms of team leadership, develop cohesive allies. Strengthen and reward, continually reward good relationships. I think this is a good philosophy for social as well as business relationships. Mm -hmm. Where you find a chance to enhance the the value of another's interest do so i learned this abundance principle 30 some years ago in negotiations it's quite the the, the holistic way of looking at negotiations but a successful negotiator a good leader looks out for the interests of the other party with whom they're negotiating more so than that other person can for themselves hmm. we all can see the blind spot of another and, and critique others so you have a generous attitude about being helpful or expanding, building a bigger pie to share, uh, as in, in crowd promotion work that entrepreneurs often are inclined to do. Everything's done through teamwork these days. Mm -hmm. uh, hence, th that enhances the, the team leadership, that we all feel strong, we all feel a sense of power. That's how David McClellan defined power as an inner experience. How can a manager then, if, if somebody's working with all these people and they're dealing with, again, so many personality types, how can a manager be effective uh, and, and kind of getting what they want from somebody? How can they get that, make, make their employees or their subordinates do what they want them to do in a style that's not going to offend the other person or cause them any distress? Well, I can't promise that <laughs> styles won't get some measure in, of In stress. general, in general. In, in general, yeah, even if you're baking a cake with your loved one in the kitchen, you might argue over who's using the spoon. Of course. Uh, that's not a point of divorce, but certainly a, a, a minor uh, minor argument, intelligent argument, we would say. There's some of the more forward-thinking progressive people in the training industry know that onboarding is very important. Whether you're a big corporation, if you're two guys fixing uh, cars in a garage, the first few minutes is the the first impression counts so much. Oftentimes, I, I visited with the construction industry business owners yesterday, and safety first, safety training, technical training, then then get out in the field and get to work. However, the failure of many of these programs, and I shouldn't say failure, but perhaps an employee assistance program oversight. Is not surveying up front what the client, the customer, the new employee wants. 
if you can identify the personal wins and ask that directly right up front, then you know the motivators. If someone's coming to apply as an employee to my company, mm-hmm. I would ask you very directly, what do you want? How much power do you need? How much creative latitude do you need? Do you like to be locked in a room and, and think and do, or, or do you need interaction? And to what degree? What, what are wins? And these wins should be identified and listed. Mm-hmm. Everyone's individual and everyone's different and everyone's uh, definition of their personal wins, their motivators, should be defined. Unfortunately, uh, sometimes we feel like it's an employer's market, and it is. So we have all, all the power. We've got the candy. We've got the job. But really, that final, that second, third, fourth interview, that should be a mutual sell. Mm-hmm. That should be mutual persuasion by that point. Not that you think you probably 90% want this person, but you really want them to level with you and tell you what is their point, their, their breaking point in terms of stress. What is it they absolutely can't stand? What's not? What's objectionable to them? And it could be something as as simple as um, people smoking in the parking lot. You know, this may be a minor discussion among the lower level employees, but it may be a big win if you as a manager give attention to this, address it, and don't have meetings by the picnic table where the smoke drifts over. Mm -hmm. You would not have this information if you did not do a proper onboarding process, which actually has three major elements, which I'll save for paying customers. Very good. And so you're, you're, you're saying give your employees a little bit more freedom, a little bit more flexibility, listen to them, listen to their wants, their needs, their pains, and help level with them so that you guys are on the same page and so that the, as the business owner or whoever is employee, the employer, the HR person, that they're actually accommodating both sides and not just the employee seeking out employment, but rather the employer seeking out a good mutual relationship with an employee who's not only going to be loyal, but is also going to be driven to produce whatever it is that they're being hired to produce. You add a very good point that the at a certain point where you're close to hiring, the hiring person is an advocate for both parties. Mm-hmm. Not just the company pr- primarily, but if that HRD, HR person, uh, that hiring person has really done the onboarding process, has a list of the wins, they can then communicate those wins vertically. Mm-hmm. A survey of those wins by employees helps upper management to then shape their motivation and incentive program. Okay. Yeah, definitely. And Frank, I, I know this is we're gonna pivot here a little bit and I'm gonna I'm gonna kinda throw uh, kinda throw something here that you you may be not comfortable talking about, but I'm just curious, when you have a negative interaction with a client, what is your strategy to mitigate that? And how can you pivot so that you don't have that negative interaction again? so that you can bring that into a positive interaction. Much like, you know, as an employee seeking an, uh, an employer, there could be tension there. How can we move around that tension so that we can accomplish our goals? I, I think one of the biggest mistakes I made was making a stupid Saturday party introduction, a goofy kind of introduction in a professional setting, mm-hmm. letting the, the, the living room goofball out rather than greeting someone properly. and I. I said something I shouldn't have said, and it made me reflect that first impressions do count. And the reason they count, as you probably know, uh, you know about confirmation bias, there's a physiological equivalent. We have many more dopamine receptors that are triggered by interaction of the amygdala and the limbic brain for negativity. It's called the negativity bias, if you want to Google it up versus positive feelings. So it's much easier for one to remember an insult or, or, or a discourtesy, as I think I was unintentionally with my, my bad words coming out of my mouth without thinking, without my uh, conscience uh, policing the words for their out. I was ashamed as soon as I said something stupid. So I think about this, and to answer your question, it's a tough one because if you've been a jerk on the first impression, I uh, said the wrong thing or made the wrong comment inappropriately. Uh, when you come back and try to be normally polite, the attitude be- confronts a bias. Oh, look at this jerk warming up to me who was so rude to me yesterday. Right. So first of all, one needs to be aware of this, that there's resistance. You can't just shift gears. For me, 
to answer the question, in my personal experience, I did have this experience. I realized I said the wrong thing. I tossed and turned all night. I even confessed to my mother uh, about what I said, my 96-year-old mom. And she said, Frankie, don't be hard on people. <laughs> so I reflected on myself, and I waited for the right time to, um, to take my punishment, and I asked for time with this person and met with them and, and reflected on this bad moment, this bad first impression, and I sincerely, sincerely apologized. I really felt bad for her, her this person's feelings, and after some discussion, uh, the heat did go down, and we embraced and, and let go of it. So, so I think, uh, one, being aware that we are the producers of stress on others. Mm -hmm. We often think of others as the stressors, but I, I think we need to look more about how our, st sometimes just our style, our delivery, uh, can be offensive to others. And in that sure. particular case, I was assuming this was the best friend i known forever, could take a little fraternal teasing, and it was highly inappropriate. It, it was actually one of those fault finder types. So, uh, owie. And I did learn from it, and I did grow from that. Yeah, and, the, you know, we all make mistakes. I think, Frank, the moral of the story, and, and I guess everything that we're getting at here, is just be real. I mean, you've got to be, be real. We're, we're, we're all humans. We're going to make mistakes, and we're going to have our trials and tribulations through the course of our businesses, through our lives. And those are things that we have to accommodate for. And understanding that there will be mistakes, we will offend people, and nothing is going to be perfect. Uh, and sort of accepting that reality is what I'm gathering, that you're, you're basically speaking, hey, just listen to other people. Be as human as you can be with these people and just be real with them. You know, we don't need yeah. to have all these sort of constructs and structures that we create right. just so that we can we can create this facade of power or facade of leadership. It could be very right. genuine if it's just coming from the heart. Frank, very good information today. I know we're getting really close to time here, and I just want to thank you so much for being on the show here today. Frank, to get a little bit more information about you um, or some of your work, where can we find you? The best way to track me and my activities, um, and particularly my public activities, is through frankdominicus.com. Great. Simply check my calendar. There will also be a, a booking calendar for those of you who want a few minutes who might have questions. Excellent. Thank you so much. And we'll provide the link here at the bottom of the podcast. Uh, so if anybody wants to check you out, we'll definitely go to frankdominicus.com. Frank, do you have any closing comments here before we, we sort of you know finish up here and wrap things up? Yes, uh, what I my takeaway from today's conversation, my high point is remembering that the highest form of power, which, whether we're talking in terms of individual or team leadership, is share power. Okay. One plus one equals three, the old synergy concept. So I encourage listeners and as a reminder to you and myself that there's more of us when we give more of ourselves to others and in humility recognize the greatness of others. Very good. Thank you, Frank, for being on the show. I'm sure if anybody has any questions, feel free to comment um, either on the YouTube video or you can comment directly on the show itself on the website. Uh, and again, thank you so much for being here, uh, and we'll, we'll chat soon.